it is it is a film which you just have to take with not so much a pinch of salt. It's a very large bucket of salt, and you just you've just got to go with the flow with this film. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Ken, for joining. Today, we're going to talk about the movie, The Importance of Being Earnest. Yes, we are. And when you first mentioned this last time, my heart kind of sunk because I'm not big into period dramas of, of this particular era. Definitely not the kind of film I think I would have chosen. Although, initially, I thought it was like a, a, a Bronte-type play of some kind, which had been transferred to the big screen. But actually, it's it's an Oscar Wilde play. Uh, and obviously, the importance of being earnest is a play on words, very much a play on words. I've now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. I'm going to jump straight in and by say, yes, it, my heart did sing. But actually, once I started to watch this, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's an interesting rom-com. I think from the late the late nineties, early two thousands. I'm not quite sure of the exact production date on this one. It's it's a plot which is difficult to follow initially because it's about people leaving leading double lives and having double names. And I'm lousy with names. I really am lousy with names. So trying to follow who some of these people were in relation to their names. Okay. I was having to really concentrate. But yeah, I mean, why did you why did you choose this film well, in the first I place? I chose it one because I really like Colin Firth. I first discovered him in Pride and Prejudice back in the 90s, I think. I really like movies with him. And so that was one reason. And I do like this kind of storyline. Like I go see a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan plays, which is a lot of like mistaken identity, switched at birth type of stories. And mm -hmm. this is definitely that and play in words. So you have the play in words of Ernest being the name, but also Ernest being the word of being yeah. like honest and earnest. And then you have the whole mistaken identities and this kind of like switched at birth or lost at birth and type of thing that's discovered at the end. We have Jack, who's the main character played by Colin Firth, who when he goes, he lives in the country, when he goes into London, he pretends to be earnest. Well, it is earnest in town and Jack in the country. And mm -hmm. he, when he's in the country, he tells everybody that he has a younger brother named Ernest. So he has mm -hmm. this whole younger brother that gets in a lot of trouble. And in the city, he's friends with Algy. Now, Algy has a cousin named Gwendolyn that Jack wants to marry. Gwendolyn has, her mother is Lady Bracknell, and she wants her daughter to marry well. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Mr. Worthing. Rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. In society. And this is all during the Victorian period, because mm -hmm. as we said, it was Oscar Wilde who wrote this in 1895. So it's the Victorian period. So there's a lot of, like, kind of rejecting some of the social norms, I guess, of, of the Victorian period. So Lady Bracknell yeah. wants her daughter to marry well. We have Cecily, who is Jack's ward, kind of like his niece, but his ward. Now, Jack wants, as I said, Jack wants to marry Gwendolyn. And when he has a interview with Lady Bracknell, he tells the whole story of how he lost his parents. And she says, well, to lose one parent is like so, something along the lines to lose one parent may be thought of as being an unfortunate, but to lose two parents is, is irresponsible, right? And so he tells the story <laughs> of how he was found in a railway station, Victoria railway station, Victoria Railway Station. Yes. And so basically he was found in a handbag. And so his name was, they named him for the, the place where he was found, which was the Worthing Station at Victoria State, the Worthing Stop. He, the, the person who found him or the person who picked up the bag, uh, the bags had been swapped, as, as you said. A bag was left at the station at Victoria Station. Uh, the owner came back to pick it up. He picked up the wrong bag and he was going to Worthing. So he was named, he was named as Worthing. I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both 
Looks like carelessness. Um, I think the well, <laughs> wasn't so much he lost parents. It was like he was mislaid. He was yeah, very he was much mislaid. mislaid. Like, he, he she was... says, "Oh, you lost him. Like you were, you were, uh, <laughs> you were irresponsible, and you lost him." But he was mislaid, and he was mislaid by his like governess at the time, I guess. Who yes. apparently, we, in the end of the thing, we find out that she was writing a three-volume novel, and she put the novel inside of the perambulator. Perambulator. Yeah. Perambulator. And so that is basically a baby carriage. And she put the baby inside of the handbag and she left the handbag in the cloakroom at the Worthing station or the Victoria she left station. The bag, uh, yeah, she left, I think she left it at Victoria station um, and the gentleman who, who picked the bag up was going to Worthing. But yeah, perambulator, uh, shortened today in English to pram. Okay. Pram, yeah, so great word. I mean, the whole film is dotted with some very some words of the era. Uh, even the names of the cast, of, of the, the protagonists. Algernon, we have Ernest, we have Gwendolyn, we have Cis Cecily. 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 And then we have um, uh, Augusta, which is the Lady Bracknell. So there's some great names in there, which you just don't hear today. So, uh, And the, the film itself is dotted with occasional words, which are... I'm not going to say no longer in use, but they're very they're very antiquated now. But yeah, the, the story about him being left in a cloakroom at a at a train station, having been then being found, and the story of how he doesn't know who his parents are, uh, he doesn't understand how how you know why he was in the bag in the first place. And you say this this is due to Miss uh, Prism. Miss Prism being the the matron, the nurse, the 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 help of the house who who was writing a book of some kind and uh, unfortunately managed to put the baby in the bag and put that into the cloakroom rather than her manuscript. Uh, bizarre kind of plot, a very yeah. bizarre kind of plot. I mean, I'd hate to think how drunk these people were or how many drugs they had taken to come up with a weird plot like this. And, and so then we have Algie who finds out that Jack is pretending to be Ernest in the city and pretending that he has a yeah. younger brother. And he finds out the address in the country and he knows that he has this ward named Cecily who's just 18. So he decides to go to the country and to pretend to be the younger brother, Ernest, which the people of the house of Jack, Jack's house, don't really know Ernest. They don't, they wouldn't have recognized him. So when he comes and presents himself as Jack's younger brother, they say, oh, okay. And he falls in love with Cecily. Cecily falls in love with him. In fact, she has already formed in her mind this whole romance with this unfortunate brother, Ernest, which she's never met. And so, mm -hmm they fall in love jack and gwendolyn fall in love but the problem with these two loves is that both cecily and gwendolyn really had always in their mind that they wanted to fall in love with somebody named ernest and both algie and jack are really not named ernest <laughs> the only really safe name is ernest gwendolyn oh. we must get married at once are you called algie i cannot deny it your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Mm. Now, for those listening, if you're really confused, that's how I felt with this film. From the beginning, I'm like, whoa, 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 excuse me, uh, what's going on here? Because of the name changes and because of these identities of these two male protagonists who are, they're a bit, well, one of them in particular, Algernon, is... is He's kind of bankrupt. He's kind of living on the edge. He's being chased by debtors. And there's this double life they both have in terms of Jack Ernest going to the city, which I'm pretty much, it's, it's going to be London. It, I don't think it's ever specified. And living this, this nightlife of going out drinking, womanizing, about, you know, just having a free life outside of the perceived um, Victorian constraints that he has in his country house. They both, oh well, okay, so Jack 
Ernest <laughs> is quite well to do. He owns a very nice house. He's got butlers. He's got servants. He, you know, he's 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 got money. But when he goes to the city, he's a bit of a rogue because he leaves the Savoy after having a meal and doesn't pay for it. So I'm not. It's <laughs> yeah. I like I said when when we first started this chat, I I kind of started to watch this film and was like slightly confused and found myself really having to think about the names of these characters and how these characters were developing. And it's quite a convoluted and funny kind of story. I mean, you're talking about Algernon turning up at Jack's house in a hot air balloon. <laughs> yes, in a hot air balloon. <laughs> it is, and as you and said, this, it's, is, this is just like... I'm not sure if that was added, if, if Oscar Wilde actually wrote the hot air balloon or if the, the, the um, producers or director decided to do that. Um, but it is well, like... Slightly, sur slightly surreal. <laughs> slightly <laughs> surreal, to say the least. Along with some very weird dream sequences, um, where the Cecily is is having these these dreams about being rescued by a knight on horseback and being tied to a tree and him cutting her off the tree. Cecily, it is it is a film which you just have to take with not so much a pinch of salt, it's a very large bucket of salt. And you just, you've just got to go with the flow with this film and just accept this very bizarre Victorian story about the morals of the era and the uh, Oscar Wilde trying to buck the trend in terms of how he saw Victorian morality. I mean, during the story itself, during the film, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm aware of, of Oscar Wilde and what have you, and a bit about his reputation. But during the film, there are there's a lot of innuendo. There's a lot of things said. There's, there's, there are kind of uh, eye contact and little noises which just infer that sex and sexuality and desire is bubbling up under the surface. It's just it's waver thin between between things happening. Um, which can't happen because society won't allow it to happen. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to throw this one back over to you. And so, like you said, it's hard to follow at first. And I'll tell you, like when I go see Gilbert and Sullivan, I usually have to read what they call the the each of synopsis for acts before, even if yeah. I've seen the play before, because they're a little bit harder to follow. And I think anybody watching this, if they went over to Wikipedia or the IMBD website and kind of read the little synopsis first, it probably would be helpful. Kind of follow it. Mm. That, that being said, I think like once, once you kind of get an idea of the characters and everything and just kind of like really decide to watch it and follow it, it's funny. It's funny. There's yes. all these different like characters and mistaken identities and all that. And the whole thing where Oscar Wilde was kind of rejecting the whole Victorian type of like stifled society at the time, mm. for sure. Maybe because it's Oscar Wilde, maybe because it's from 130 years ago, there's a lot more thought gone into the script. I think a lot of films today are quite vacuous. They're really kind of simple. But this, because it comes from a play, and a play which was which was written in the, 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 the very last end of the 19th century, it's... It's really quite involved, and I think it's it's indicative of the fact that potentially the audiences in those days had a far greater potential intelligence. They they reveled on intricate plots and difficult plots, and this these ideas of, as you say, people being lost, people being found, double lives, and all this kind of stuff. So it, it's definitely a film which you have to you do have to watch. And like you know, going back to something you said, and I think I've already said is like. Once I got into it, once I started to kind of grasp who these characters were, once I started to grasp how the storyline was going, I really was kind of enjoying the fun of it. Um, I was enjoying how the, the plays on words, the plays between how these people were interacting and the fact that they were, because they were lying, there was this, this deceit. Thank you. I felt there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin. Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? 
once once they kind of all started to come together, all the characters came together at the the stately home, the uh, the home of um, of Jack Stroke Ernest, that things started to unravel. Yes, algae. Oh, here is Ernest. Oh, my own Ernest. Gwendolyn, my darling. Oh. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. And they, you know, trying to ex extricate themselves from their imaginary lives or their lives in another place became quite funny. And, and, and yes, it is, it, is a, it is a sort of a love story. Or a potential love story um, between these four main protagonists. There are two more, which is um, which I which just they 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 touch upon Miss Prism, who is or was the the nurse, uh, and also a vicar, whose name is very weird. It's Doctor Chisbull, Chisbull. Yeah, was, I think so. yeah, again, a very odd name, must be of the era. And there's a, there's a little bit of a, a romance going on between these two people as well. But merely for the purposes of clarification, when you said you didn't, did you mean you didn't say you wanted to see me? Or that you didn't in fact want to see me? Isn't language a curious thing? Well, so it's not just the main romance between Jack, Ernest, and Gwendolyn, but also Algernon, Ernest, and Cecil, Cecily, Cecily, Cecily. Cecily. These names are quite difficult, and Cecily because they, they just they are such odd names. So yes, there is there is a love element. So you know this this is this is a rom com, pure simple, obviously set in the end of the Victorian era, and it's. It's a very, it's a very good rom com. It's a very good rom com. A, a romantic comedy, as we call it, a rom com for short. It's a very good romantic comedy. The language throughout the film is relatively clear, relatively easy. It's the characters. It's the change of characters. It's the double lives. It's the the lost baby, and how the baby was lost, and the relationship with the 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 present that they are living in which is slightly confusing and slightly odd and which, which struck me initially is which took me a little bit of time to get my head around i think how they resolve it at the end it's a bit like a colombo film where or you know a couple of colombo tv series where they kind of all stood around and Lord bracknell's house number 104 upper grosvenor street in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex Things are being explained because, to be perfectly honest, I kind of needed that at the end to kind of clarify things, but actually, I was still confused. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. I was still confused as to how some of these characters got to where they are at that particular point in the film. I mean, how is Jack? How was, who, who adopted Jack? How was he adopted? How was Algernon? How did he end up where he ended up? There's a lot of things which are not really explained. Yeah, Jack seems to be adopted by some very wealthy person who has, yeah. a, has a daughter named Cecily. And he must decide to give Jack the money and the estate and everything. And then Lady Bracknell, she, we find out in the end that her sister was the mother of Jack and that Lady Prism was the, the, the governess or the nurse that lost or misplaced Jack in the handbag. So we find out that, that Lady Bracknell is, is Jack's aunt. And Lady yeah. Bracknell is also Algie's aunt. And so there's also this thing that happens in this time period where it's perfectly fine for first cousins to marry. You see that a lot in Jane Austen and, and all these type of, because that was fine. So you have, yeah, Algie who's going to marry Cecily, who's, oh, I think Cecily's not related to him. I'm very, I'm still confused. But Jack <laughs> is related to Gwendolyn. They're cousins. I'm glad, I'm glad you're not the only one who's confused. Yeah, yeah, Jack. <laughs> 
talking about Lady Bracknell. Indeed, when I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. Uh, you said it was her sister who who conceived who conceived Jack, or um, but she seems to have been a good time girl because she's portrayed in a I'm not going to say a bordello, but certainly a a, a theatre of low standing, should we say? But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Yeah. Um, the, the, the film kind of starts off or very quickly gets into this, this sort of seedy underbelly of major cities at night with dancing girls and gambling and drinking. It kind of comes across as somebody who may not have been as fine and upstanding and virtuous as the Victorian era would have um, thought she should have been. So I'm going to kind of come back so the audience watching this, if you are confused, by myself and Rochelle, you're going to be more confused by this film, but it is absolutely worth watching just because it's a fun film. And uh, yeah, so it, it is, I don't know where to go with this because it is such, it, 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 these relationships are only tentatively touched upon throughout the whole film. And it really does take a bit of effort to, to, to listen and to watch and to try and fill the holes in which the film does not give you in terms of the the backstory i mean you can only get so much into either a play or into a film obviously in a book you can really expand upon people's characters you can expand upon the relationships that they have their backstory their history but within a film sometimes you've just got to roll with punches and just accept what you're given and I think this is the kind of film where you've just got to roll with the punches, accept what's going on, not judge it too much, not ask too many questions about how these relationships fit together. Because if you do, you're going to miss the point of the film. Exactly. And we, we talked earlier about Cecily, played by Reese Witherspoon from the United States. She didn't have a lot of yeah. lines. I mean, that part in the play did not have a lot of lines, but probably also because of the fact that they stuck her in there maybe to grab the American audience, but she obviously had to probably have a, have a, a voice coach for the English accent. Yeah. Um, she does a very, very good job, but you notice that her lines are quite short. They're not, they're not huge monologues. Um, I'm going to say the native English cast, the, the dialogue seems to be a lot longer. It seems to be a lot more complicated. Her dialogue seems to be quite short. I'm not going to say stilted, but it, it's not. She does a bloody good job of, of a very good English accent. But yeah, her her speech, her chunks of speech are relatively short. I think it's fairly common to drop, to get in American actors, actresses to, to build or to give potentially a greater selling point into the US. I mean, the film itself is dotted with some fairly well-established British actors you know, in bit parts. So, you know, it's a very good cast. There's a lot of very good actors in there, period actors. So, but yeah, her her role is, although she is like a main protagonist in terms of the love, sto the love story, her lines are relatively short. Um, I could be completely mistaken, but I just, every time I, you know, I watched it twice and I just thought they're keeping these short, they're keeping this to, to, an, to a point where she can probably deal with the, the dialogue and creating a very authentic English accent. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you keep a diary? I give anything to see it, may I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And yeah, so I, I think overall, it's like a good movie for kind of like... Language learning. Yeah, Clear. yeah. I think I think it's a good, but, good, good movie for some language learning. And what would you, what would your um, advice on the language learning be for this one? It's, I mean, as a film, it's very, again, it's very clear. It's very clear. So to follow the language is is really clear. It's there's again, there's not a lot of music on the top of it. It's not fast paced. It's relatively slow paced. So uh, as a language learning exercise, I think it's relatively easy. There are words from the era which are dropped in, 
and as I've mentioned previously, the names are quite unusual. They're not names you're going to hear today. So, but that's drawing very much from the fact that it, this was written in, in the late 1800s and they're using the, pretty much the same plot and the same names. But apart from the occasional word, I think it's relatively clear. It's quite slow. It's a little more stilted, I'm going to say, in terms of the way it's, the, the way it's spoken, which I, I think is a great help. Absolutely great help. Some beautiful scenery, some lovely locations, um, a really nice period drama. And I think for those with a good level of English, I think this is going to be an absolute joy to watch. And also it's going to be a challenge to, to follow the plot to some extent. I think I may have to watch it again just to kind of to clar clarify and clear up a couple more things. I did thoroughly enjoy it the first time, like I say, after coming after my heart sinking initially when you gave me the title, watching it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a great rom-com. I thought it was just a lovely idea, which was pretty well executed. I don't think it had a massive budget as a film. They generally don't British films, but yeah, well, well worth watching and a, a good, a good choice on good choice on your behalf. Well, thank you. And so what will our next movie be? I'm gonna go for something from I believe, because it's a while since I've seen this film, it's a good few years. It's a film called, let me see if I can get this on, Gregory's Girl. Okay. I have now, if memory, if memory serves me right, this is a late 80s film set in Scotland. So I kind of chosen it because, again, it's a slowish film. There's a Scottish accent. I've seen clips of it on... I, 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 I've seen it I've, I've, but many, many years ago, but there's a Scottish accent, which is quite mild, but for those learning English, uh, it may be slightly challenging to have this slightly different accent, which isn't the conventional, either American or very RP accent you're then, you know, people are normally used to listening to. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a, again, it's a, it's a rom-com, it's a romantic comedy. It's very nice, it's very, it's very gentle, it's quite slow but it does have a very noticeable Scottish accent, which I'm going to say is toned down, is toned down. So I've, I've kind of chosen that in the hope that the audience enjoy this type of film and uh, maybe realise that the English accent or English as a whole, the English accent, English as a whole has a lot of different accents, mm -hmm. you know, so... Uh, and it, I think it's a good thing to listen to various accents so you do realise that if you come to the UK especially, but if you go to the US or Australia, the, the accent is different. And even though you might have a very good level of English, if all you've ever listened to is the BBC or pure RP or an American accent, you're going to find somebody with an accent from another part of the world, another English speaking part of the world, more problematic. So I've kind of chosen it one, because it's a great film and two, because I'm hoping that it will challenge people in terms of uh, their English understanding or their understanding of the English language. All right, be well, say. I'm gonna have to go and hunt that down, as you say, maybe on eBay and get myself a copy of it. Brilliant, well, I hope you enjoy it. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.